Okay, this is David Zeeler, director of the Caltech Heritage Project. It's Monday, May 2nd, 2022. I am delighted to be here with Dr. Susan Huff. Sue, it's great to be with you. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, it's, yeah, I'm really looking forward to talking to you. Sue, to start, would you please tell me your title and institutional affiliation? So I am a formerly a research geophysicist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Pasadena. Um, that's a governmental job classification of geophysicist. Um, I'm essentially a seismologist. Um, and I've been in Pasadena since 1992, almost exactly 30 years. So let's start first on the institutional side. What are the connections both formally and informally between USGS in Pasadena and Caltech Seismolab? Yeah, wow. Um, I, you probably, I'm sure you've covered this um, this ground, but the the coordination is um, sort of integral to um, USGS operations in general. So Caltech was in Southern California running a seismic network going back to the 1920s. And the US government was really, well, the US Geological Survey was not in the earthquake monitoring business uh, for most of that time. There were governmental agencies that installed specialized strong motion instruments to record big earthquakes going back to the 1930s. Um, but seismic networks were really run by universities. And then in 1976 or 77, the government launched the first ever federal program aimed at risk reduction. So the National Earthquake Hazard, no, sorry, <laughs> NEHR, National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. It should have been called Risk Reduction Program. But um, at that point, the USGS became the lead agency within NEHRP for seismic monitoring. So at that point, the USGS got into the earthquake monitoring business. So um, you're getting the long answer. Um, That's great. In California, there were two existing seismic networks, one operated by Berkeley in Northern California and the one operated by Caltech in Southern California. And the state is split diagonally, uh, sort of this way. And people call it the, um, the gutenberg byerly discontinuity, jokingly, because Bino Gutenberg was in Southern California, Perry Byerly was in Northern California, and they sort of, I don't know, somehow agreed on who, you know, which turf would be covered by, by which group. Um, it really should be the wood Byerly discontinuity because Harry Wood was the, si the driving force behind the seismic network. But in any case, there were these two seismic networks um, that were both quite small, small numbers of, in, of instruments. When the USGS wanted to, um, or started to get involved with earthquake monitoring, in Northern California, they set up um, a group in Menlo Park um, that, and they, they set off on their own. So they did not, the USGS scientists in, in Northern California did not team up with Berkeley. So they they ended up with two kind of parallel networks, um, which is a legacy that has reverberated through to the present. Whereas in Southern California, um, the, the, and I'm not sure who the folks were who were spearheading the USGS part of it, but they went from the start to Caltech to work in partnership, um, running a seismic network that was then you know, very much um, expanded with additional resources. So going back, that would have been the late 70s. So at that point, the Pasadena office, the, its whole reason for existence was operating a seismic network in, in collaboration with Caltech. And for the I joined the office in 92. At that point, 
every, um, all of the scientists in the office had been focused on what we call network seismology. So looking at, you know, using seismic networks to record and, and study earthquakes, typically to locate them, determine the magnitudes, that kind of thing. Um, I was hired to, boy, this gets into the weeds, um, to look at ground motions. So how strong does the ground shake when there's an earthquake, which is, it used to be separate really from network seismology. But when, when I was hired, I was the first person who um, from the 70s wasn't focused on classic network seismology. So then, so there was this partnership that was all focused on network seismology from the 70s. Over time, the Pasadena office has, and the USGS has broadened its, um, its portfolio. So it's now, um, uh, there's a lot more going on than network seismology. And so some of it's done in close coordination with the Seismo Lab. Uh, some of it's more independent, um, but this, the network is still uh, run as a joint project and a lot of the research is still um, collaborative. So I asked on the institutional side, for you personally, what are your professional connections, both formally and informally, with the Seismo Lab, just on a day-to-day -day level? Um, formally, it's changed over the years. As um, At one point, I was... At one point, they had adjunct faculty positions. I believe that's gone away. Um, I honestly don't know. I think I'm an external affiliate or something. I don't pay too much <laughs> too much attention to um, sort of what my formal um, could you could you sit on thesis committees? Could you do that kind of thing if you wanted? I, so I have in the past. I've been on um, one that I'm thinking about. I've I've co supervised postdocs. I've collaborated with uh, faculty and researchers. So it, it's very, you know, it's very collaborative, um, sort of organically. So and you start, you might start working on something and realize that someone's interested in it and collaborations develop. Um, in terms of the overall mission, both of the USGS in Pasadena and the Seismo Lab, where is the overlap for collaboration and where are there really different spheres of the mission where there might not be obvious uh, opportunity to collaborate? Yeah, I think, so the USGS is focused very directly on understanding seismic hazard and reducing risk. So, studies that are purely academic, like looking at the, the, the Seismo Lab has long um, been interested in global seismology. So using, um, using data from certain types of uh, seismic instruments to kind of probe the whole earth, like developing, it's sort of like um, CAT scan technology, but you can develop models for what's going on in the earth. You can try to figure out the geodynamics. Um, that's not generally relevant for, for hazard. So USGS scientists aren't involved with that kind of, um, that kind of work. So basically the overlap is where the seismology is relevant to seismic hazard. So for your own scholarship, from your educational trajectory, your graduate work to your career, what have been the main areas of research you focused on? Um, so one has been what's called ground motion seismology, which involves looking at recorded um, seismic waves to understand how the ground shakes when an earthquake happens. So part of that is understanding how the waves propagate through the crust and how shaking is modified by local geologic structure. So that's been um, 
that's been one focus and that dovetails with with work that's been done traditionally at the seismo lab uh, developing methods to predict how the ground will shake um, based on computer models for example um, i've looked at historical earthquakes um, I've looked at induced earthquakes, so earthquakes that are um, essentially caused by human forces of some kind. Um, what else? I've looked at how earthquakes interact with one another. So once you have an earthquake, how does that influence other faults potentially and, and um, sometimes trigger other earthquakes? Um, and a range of things. I want to get to the bigger question of how you became a prolific writer and historian in seismology, but to stay on the research <laughs> side of things, has all of your research and all of your historical appreciation for the development of the field, has that influenced your work as a scientist at all? Um, has the appreciation, it's, it's, has the science, it, it's hard to say what's, where's the chicken and where's the egg. Um, I started looking at, boy, um, you start looking at historical earthquakes and you very quickly get drawn into the, the historical aspect of, of earthquakes, you know, what, what was going on at the time, what were scientists saying at the time? Um, so I think when I, when I was in school, history was the one subject I actually didn't care for. I thought it, it, the way it was taught in all the way through high school was just so dead dull, <laughs> you know, memorize these dates and what happened. And, um, then when I finally got to, when I was an undergraduate, I had an interesting history class. It was all about why things happened and, you know, um, but yeah, I think it's um, historical seismology is sort of the gateway drug <laughs> into, the, <laughs> into the history of science. And, and there has, were some. Has USGS been supportive? I mean, in other words, do you take sabbaticals when you write a book? Is that sort of like a, a nighttime <laughs> hobby? How do you integrate that with your full time work? Yeah, well, it's a hobby um, or avocation. So. USGS ethics rules allow scientists to write on their own time. And it's really not a matter of profit per se. You know, you're, you're not, you don't get rich writing um, nonfiction science books, but writing, blah, blah, blah. you know, one of the reasons to write a book like Richter Scale. Um, apart from USGS, my USGS position is one, it's not what the USGS pays me to do. Um, but also when you write for the USGS, there's levels, levels of review and you know, everything has to be, every statement has to be very precisely stated and qualified and referenced it. And you can't, it's really hard to write for a general audience and meet all those requirements. So um, doing it as what's called unofficial expression was, was really the only way to write books like I wanted to write. And the ethics rules actually for the government, they're fairly clear and they're fairly sensible. They allow scientists, they don't allow you to go and profit from the work that you're doing as part of your official duties. So I couldn't go consult on seismic ground motions and be paid for it. But they allow you to draw on your general knowledge of the field for outside writing and speaking, as long as you're not taking your, your official work and, and somehow parlaying that into a for-profit activity. Sue, so was, there, all, was there an, 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 an original idea or an individual that inspired you to jump into nonfiction writing like you have? Um, and growing up, I sort of tore through 
the some of the, the work by the the top science writer Stephen Jay Gould. Um, I was reading sort of everything I could get my hands on by him through high school. Um, let's see who else. Just there were other writers, but I, I always enjoyed reading that kind of story. So um, there's sort of a storytelling aspect of it that that I enjoy doing. I enjoy kind of looking at the more personal sides of, of stories. Um, and let's see, I had another thought, but I lost it. Um, between either how small the field was at its origins or by just the, the mode of science, how the science gets done, do you see seismology as being particularly conducive to storytelling? Is there a natural narrative that's there to, to grab onto? Well, um, it's sort of the one science that I know. Um, it is... I think the way the field develops, it's conducive to that. You now, if you tried to talk, physics was you know, an active field of science for, for a long time. And seismology really got started as a modern field of, of, of science in the 19th century, late 19th century. Um, so there's a lot of relatively recent um, interesting history that you can you can piece together. You know what what was being done. Um, yeah, I guess I haven't thought about what another field would would be like, but um, yeah, a lot of the a lot of key there were good archival um, collections for for the work that I've done. Um, Robert T. Hill, who was um, active from the late 19th century through the mid 20th century, and Bailey Willis, and then Charles Richter. It's a lot of interesting characters from say 1870, 1880 through, through the present. So what I'd like to do is if we can take all of your knowledge, everything that you've gained from researching all the books and articles <laughs> you've done and sort of put them into amalgam and an amalgam of, of, of answers, really tracing the origins of the Seismo program, the Seismo Lab at Caltech. So going okay. back to the 1920s, is your sense that the origins of the Seismo Lab really were about needing a central point of excellence in science? Was that really the the, 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 the the tipping point that allowed the Seismo Lab to become what it eventually would be? Yeah, I think Harry Wood is, was the one real driving force going back to 1915, 1916. You know, he among, there, were, there was already a, a nascent seismology community in the Bay Area, work done after 1906. And Wood was at the forefront realizing that there must be earthquake hazard in Southern California. Um, he wasn't the only one, but he was the one um, who was spearheading proposals to the, the Carnegie Institute was the main, um, the main one that I know about. And yet proposing to develop a seismological research program, but anchored by a local seismic network. Um, and that's something you see today. So seismic networks tend to really anchor um, earthquake programs. Um, so yeah. That got started. I mean, it, it took obviously some some time and some development, but um, that the proposals were initially funded. Um, you know, 1920, 1921. Okay. 
Was the Seismolab involved from the beginning not only in utilizing the detectors, but improving the technology of, of detection? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, the, um, so net seismology, um, as of 1920, seismometers were these behemoth, the uh, big, heavy instruments that mostly recorded what we call teleseismic waves. So very waves you'd never feel from large earthquakes around the world. Um, so magnitude eight happens in Japan and these giant instruments, the waves are very, very slow, long period. And these seismometers would detect them. Um, but they weren't good at recording local earthquakes. So the Seismolab was founded initially to look at local earthquakes and they needed, they, they realized that there really wasn't an instrument that fit that bill. So uh, Wood teamed up with Harry, Harry August Anderson, I think was the first names, to develop a, a different type of seismometer. And it was, it should have been called the Anderson Wood seismometer. Most people call it Wood Anderson, but it was as if I, I think models still exist at the Seismolab somewhere. It's this, you know, nifty little um, device, very different um, design than had been used in the past. And it was, it was designed specifically to record local earthquakes. So that was a, that was a really key step. There weren't off the shelf seismometers that they could have installed at the time. Um, and then there was still a gap that those instruments, Wood Andersons, get blown off scale if there's a big earthquake. They were super sensitive. And so by the 30s, there was another um, another phase in instrument development to that wasn't done at Caltech, but done elsewhere to come up with strong motion instruments that would actually record big earthquakes on scale. So this gets back to my own career. Seismology diverged from the beginning. Based on the instrumentation, you had these sensitive instruments to record local earthquakes um, that would get blown off scale if anything big happened. And then you had instruments that would only record big earthquakes. So you sort of had these two parallel tracks in seismology for a long time. And as the instrumentation has gotten better, the tracks come together. But, um, I'm yeah, curious in your research, if you ever came across any interesting information about either the scientific or the administrative reasoning to have the Seismolab sequestered off into the hills in a mansion away from campus. Oh, oh yeah, no, totally. Um, you want quiet sites to develop instruments. And um, the original Seismolab, which I was actually the Kresge lab, um, I was actually able to visit it after it had been sold, um, but before Caltech lost the access to it. Um, and it was a hood. I don't know if that structure's <laughs> what's happened to it, um, but it had caves built. It was built in the San Rafael Hills. So um, in Southern California, most of the LA Pasadena area, it's a, they're sedimentary valleys where sediments have washed down over millions of years. They aren't great sites for instruments because the, the sediments will shake. Um, you really want um, you want quiet recording sites and for most purposes, you'd like to have seismometers on bedrock, not sitting on a bunch of sediments. So um, they first had office space at um, Mount Wilson, just because that's where I guess office space was available. Um, but then the Kresge lab was built into the San Rafael Hills and then a very quiet part of Pasadena. But there were these um, vaults that were built into the, the hillside to where you could get instruments onto more confident rock. In moving the lab in the 1970s to campus, then obviously what was lost? 
Well, they kept the Kresge lab um, and they, so they moved the offices. Um, and instruments stayed at the, the Kresge lab for some years afterwards. And then eventually it was sold. Um, I actually don't know where the, I believe they moved, they had the original like PAS Pasadena uh, seismic station. That got moved somewhere in the vicinity, but they lost that had been a recording site going back to like 1927. And once it was sold, it was moved um, not too far away, but, but not the same location. So during the early years, was the Seismo Lab representative of a particular side of a debate that was happening more broadly in seismology <laughs> at that point? Oh, there have been lots of debates. Um, but there was, at the beginning, there was a debate about the severity of seismic hazard in Southern California. And that was the, uh, the great quick debate that I wrote about. So you had, and it's sort of interesting if you, um, sufficiently you had business interests that were um, trying to downplay the severity of seismic hazard. And there were some statements made that seemed very laughable on their face that Los Angeles was as free from hazard, a uh, risk from acts of God and that as any city in the U.S., um, that type of thing. Um, I'm sorry. But when you, so I think that the early scientists, Harry Wood and Charles Richter, uh, before long, were treading carefully and not making alarmist statements. Um, but if you look carefully at what these business interests in, in the city boosters, they were very worried about scaring away capital investors from the East with talk about you know, the quick hazard. Um, if you look at what they were doing, they were, they were aware of earthquake hazard and they were taking fairly prudent steps. Um, to understand it, uh, they were, so business interests were talking regularly to, to Harry Wood. There were committees that were set up on the business side and there were scientific committees and there was a lot of cross-pollination. So the, the business leaders were, you know, they were inviting Harry Wood to come talk to them and, and that sort of thing. So there was, there was a, a debate, but I'm sort of gonna give away the the punchline of my book. Um. <laughs> what were some of the bases for the debate? In other words, were people talking about earthquakes as being predictable phenomena that 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 occurred oh. cyclically? So there was a prediction that brought issues to a head that Bailey Willis, who was at Stanford at that time, came out with essentially a prediction that Southern California was going to be rocked by an earthquake comparable to 1906 within five years of 1925. And the prediction was, um, it was bogus. I mean, it was based on uh, flawed data and, and that we just, we still don't have the scientific framework to make that kind of statement that an earthquake's overdue within five years. So when that prediction came out, there was a lot of, you know, the, there was a move to fight back and to specifically to counter the, that prediction. And this was led by Robert Hill. Right. And he was the, he was the main scientist who was kind of speaking out and there was, you know, the, this was still back when um, scientists were working very hard to establish the monitoring network in Southern California. And it's always a fine line in seismology that 
if you want to raise money for earthquake science and earthquake monitoring, um, you have to scare people, want, but not too much. <laughs> yeah, you you have to stay on the right side of the law, but you do if you people tend to sort of not worry about earthquakes because they don't experience them very very often. So you have to you know, hit them over the head that. Now, earthquakes can be serious just because we haven't seen one in a damaging one in 50 years. That doesn't mean there's no risk. And then, so you're dancing with that fine line. And then always, still today. And Bailey Willis was dancing a lot closer to it than other people, but it was it was suiting the community's purposes. You know, he was out there making noise. And, um, and he sort of, he, he went a little too far over the line, and then it becomes an easy target to to debunk. Um, and yeah. So if if Robert Hill's contention has aged better, in other words, it is pretty much the consensus view now that earthquakes, so far as we can tell, are fundamentally unpredictable. What was his insight? Was he looking at data, and was he coming to essentially? the same conclusion that modern, our contemporary seismologists would be would be coming to today. Some of his insights have aged really well. And yeah, he, I think then as now, if you look at the arguments that are made about earthquake predictability, people would point to the fact that, oh, there were earthquakes in Southern California in 1769 and 1812 and 1857, and oh, look, that's a 50 year um, pattern. And even then, um, looking critically at those arguments, it was clear that they, they weren't sound because you're not talking about a repeat of the same earthquake. Um, so I think in that, um, in that argument and, and a few others, um, Hill was more insightful and maybe just more honest. Uh, not refusing to overinterpret the data. I mean, he he and other, I think also scientists knew that there was hazard in Southern California. Um, they had the, the San Andreas Hole had been mapped after 1906, that most of it all the way down to at least San Bernardino. And they knew about the San Jacinto Fault. So scientists knew that the there was earthquake hazard in in Southern California. Um, it was just a matter of you know, be, being honest about the, the limitations of, of what you could say about future earthquakes. Um, there were other statements he made that didn't age very well, um, that there was no great menace from the Newport Inglewood fault. <laughs> didn't age well. Um, but some, some of those statements that didn't age well, I concluded he was off base because the whole the field as a whole didn't understand some fundamental scientific issues. So yeah, it's 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 interesting to look back. What what did people what did people think and why did they think it? And you realize that sometimes the frameworks were just so far off base that you could make a very reasoned, sensible argument, but your, your premise was wrong. And so one of them is um, that Hill made was based on the almost universal, well, not quite universal, but at the time people believed that earthquakes um, accommodated vertical motion, that faults move things up and down, but not sideways not to great distances. And that was contentious for a long time. So Hill concluded that seismic activity in Southern California was declining. He's like, well, where did he come up with that? It turns out we know now that the vertical, the mountain building in California was way more active going back 30 million years because the, the plate tectonics was different. Now you have a, a lateral San Andreas fault um, through California, you used to have subduction. So you were you know, pushing up the, the Sierra Nevada and um, 
the transverse ranges. And so Hill was quite astute back in the early 20th century to realize that you weren't the, the mountain building in California was less active. But he didn't appreciate that there was a whole lot of, of uh, lateral faulting going on because nobody under, uh, understood plate tectonics really until 1960 or so. So, no. <laughs> so a question you've, you've, you've thought about a lot, I'm sure. Why is Richter a household name and Gutenberg <laughs> is not? How did that happen? Um, it was, it was the Richter scale. Um, and well, so through Richter started at the Seismo Lab in 1927. I want to say somewhere in there. And for decades, he was the one scientist who was most willing to talk with the media. So uh, people started to see his name, like in the local papers. But there's a letter from a seismologist at Berkeley, Perry Byerly, who was there for decades, a contemporary of Richter. He was talking about the magnitude scale and a reporter asked him what they should call it. And Byerly apparently answered, call it the Richter scale. And that's really where the iconic name recognition comes from um, because that, that caught on. And, um, yeah, and the paper, so, the Richter scale, uh, it was published in 1935. And there's some, there's some debate about controversy about this too in some quarters. Um, but Rick, it was a single author paper in, published in 1935 that developed, presented the, this first ever scale to rank the relative severity of earthquakes. And it was tuned for, tuned for Southern California. And in this paper, Richter acknowledges, um, I think he acknowledges Gutenberg for suggesting making the scale logarithmic because you have a huge range of earthquake magnitudes. And if you're going to collapse that, um, the logarithm's handy. And I think he, I think he acknowledges uh, wood for something else and then one part of the scale he developed draws on earlier work from a Japanese scientist. But my reading of that paper was it really was his, his baby. It was a project that he was really leading in the, the insight and the, the inspiration and the, the perspiration was his, but with some input along the way. And then it started to take off and Gutenberg was quickly involved with subsequent developments of the scale um, and other people as well. And if you do something that's really notable and useful in science, it just, it'll take on a life of its own and people will develop a method or, or whatever. Um, so it's sort of a hallmark of a, of a really seminal contribution. Um, and there started to be kind of you know, this buzz of, well, it should have been the Richter and Gutenberg or Gutenberg and Richter scale. And I just, I don't think so. I think, um, you know, it's appropriate to the Richter's name be on it. And there's a further point that um, if you talk to seismologists today, they will tell you that we don't use the Richter scale anymore. We should use, you know, we should call it some other magnitude scale. And it's true, it's, it's a subtle point, but the way we measure magnitudes is different. And the scale was, um, people realized that the way the, the formulism he came up with didn't really work well for big earthquakes. So the way we measure magnitude is different, but if you think about magnitudes, we report magnitude three, magnitude six, magnitude eight. 
there's no units on those numbers. It's not, you know, joules or megajoules or anything. It, it's a relative scale that Richter came up with. He defined what a three is. He defined what a six is. He defined what an eight is. He, he referenced 1906 as probably close to eight. Those definitions are still in use. We're st we are using his scale. And so I think they should be called equivalent Richter magnitudes. Um, and that that would have, I think we've, seismologists have confused people over the years by saying, well, it's not the Richter scale. Um, so that's to say on the evening news, if they report a 7.2, that's the same 7.2 that Richter would have called it. It's conceptually, it, it is, but it's, you know, what does a 7.2 mean? Um, you know, it's still dovetailing back to his definitions. That, so the six, if you read the paper, a six is a moderately, a locally damaging earthquake, for example. Um, and that's the way he tuned the scale. A three is a locally, you know, maybe a shock that's felt locally. He defined the scale so that zero was the smallest earthquake he calculated could be recorded at the surface under ordinary conditions. And that's held up. If you have a, a, a seismometer at the surface, um, there are smaller earthquakes have negative magnitudes, which gets because the scale is logarithmic. You almost never see those even today. So that there was an awful lot of insight into the, the way the scale was set up and, and tuned to produce numbers that are kind of um, what's the right word? I mean, they're not they're not meaningful in terms of units, but are you know kind of relatable and um so so yeah i would say you know 7.2 what we would estimate as a 7.2 is is an earthquake that richter would have you know said regarded as a, as that same magnitude so another name that's been not nearly as remembered in history as richter of course is hugo benioff do you have a sense of why, as an instrument builder with the seismographs, why have we forgotten his contributions, at least at the popular level? You know, very few scientists are ever famous. Um, you know, and if Richter, you know, people through my career, they probably knew Lucy Jones and Kate Hutton because their names were in the paper. Um, but you're not going to be remembered as a scientist because you were the go-to expert of the day in a certain era. There's there's plenty of scientists, including Bailey Willis. He was a go-to uh, guy for newspapers um, in the early 20th century. Nobody has any clue who he is. Um, Benioff, it, it'd be interesting to write his biography. I think he was a, must have been a really interesting character. Um, and he certainly, within seismology, we talk about Benioff zones, which you know, are, are earthquake zones associated with subduction. So there's a ton of recognition of his contributions in, in seismology, but he didn't ever do anything that ended up with his name attached that the public saw. But I'm not, you know, I tried to think of another earth scientist that's known to the public beyond Richter. Yeah, maybe Richter, um, that's, a, that's an unfair comparison. It's really, it's really because of the Richter scale that we have that name association. Yeah, and, but the fact that, you know, there was a, people have point out that uh, the public can't generally name very many female scientists. Um, but then, you know, ask a member of the public to name 10 male scientists. And <laughs> I think a lot of people would struggle. I was like, well, there's Isaac Newton and 
Uh, there's the guy who was in the wheelchair and um, now I'm trying to, you know, are there any geologists say um, that most people's yeah would recognize? So in thinking about the the history of the Seismo Lab, how well do the directors over the years serve as a stand-in for eras within the lab? In other words, is there a, a significant transition that you see from Wood to Gutenberg or from Gutenberg to Press that really defined narrative distinctions in terms of what the lab was doing? Wow. Well. I'm not sure I, um, I haven't seen the whole arc. I, one would let the charge to start the seismic lab to monitor local earthquakes when Gutenberg came in with a much more global view. So he's from Europe, an expert in global seismology. And when he came in, um, and that would have been like 1930-ish, that brought a shift towards more global seismology and would ended up lamenting the, the lack of attention to, to local earthquakes. So there was that early shift. Um, and then from 1930 through um, 1990, I wasn't, I, I'm not sure. Um, I think at times the Seismo Lab has had the Seismo Lab's relationship with the Seismic Network has evolved over time. So um, there have been periods of of questioning whether or not Caltech should be running a seismic network. You know, isn't that something that should be left to a governmental organization and it's not really research? And I think that that pendulum i'm not sure where that pendulum was at different times but i think from the time that i got there there was increasing recognition that the the network is really a world-class research resource and it really drives so many aspects of earthquake science having it's, it's one of the preeminent um regional seismic networks in the world um from the beginning and, and still today, I guess Japan's probably left California in the dust, but an awful lot of the science is is driven by the by the data collection. So I'll share a, a, a sense I'm getting from how the Seismo Lab sees itself, and you can interrogate the nature of the assumption, but in the early years, at least for the first 20 or 30 years, the Seismo Lab saw itself in many ways as the center of the world in seismology, and obviously that changed over time. First of all, is that fair? Were there competing institutions that might have also <laughs> laid claim to that title? And what were the factors that knocked the Seismo Lab, I don't want to say off its pedestal, but made it less singular in the field, perhaps? I think Caltech has never suffered from a lack of um, <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, so, um, there was, there were early observatories um, elsewhere in the world. The Jesuits were running observatories around the world for going back to around 1900. So from the very early days of instrumental seismology, um, there were, there were Jesuit um, institutions in the central US. Um, so Caltech was never, um, they were not the earliest institution to be running a seismic network. When the network went in, in the 1920s, it, as far as I know, it was the earliest local regional seismic network running these Wood Andersons. Um, so that's my donkey. <laughs> Wanna say hi? So he's a hi. He's, he's a knucklehead. Um, yes. 
So, uh, yeah, I know you're bored. <sighs> <laughs> so, yes, you can be recorded. Um, yeah, I think, and so the earthquake catalog for Southern California is the, that I know it's the, the oldest um, continuously produced earthquake catalog. So like statistical seismologists who worry about um, earthquake statistics, they do a lot of work with the catalog because it's been continuously produced since 32. Um, I think, you know, maybe the work Japan really kind of took things to, to a whole new level with their investment in seismic monitoring. And, you know, they have just, I mean, they, they set the bar for, for monitoring networks. So that may have, that may have um, kind of led to a, a sea change in, in how Caltech use its network. Um, I'm not sure. So what about the concept of data sharing? In other words, in the early years of the Seismo Lab, the data that the lab had was almost proprietary. It was theirs and people had to come to access it. Well, I mean, the data was, were recorded on paper and film chips. So it wasn't, um, <laughs> it wasn't that they wouldn't share it as much as you couldn't share it. It wasn't, it wasn't digital. So I think, um, you know, that was, so far as I know, if other people were interested in looking at the data, it would be made available, but physically you had to come to where the data was. It's just, that, that was just the way it, it went. Um, seismic networks produced bulletins from early on. So you have a seismogram, you get a P wave, and then you get an S wave and you read the times of when those P waves and S waves arrive and you use that to locate the earthquakes. Um, those bulletins would be shared. So they would you know, be, be mailed around or, or published. And then once you know, data started to be digital, then it's a new era, you, you physically can share data. Um, and I think so the, the transition to digital data, that happened when the USGS was involved with seismic monitoring. Yes, you're right. <laughs> 60 months out. Uh, no, I'm not gonna you know, I, I spent half my life on Zoom meetings and it's when I'm doing a lot of the talking and he gets that's right fancy if, if i'm just listening he doesn't really care it's a matter of um, attention grabbing <laughs> you're talking to someone other than me <laughs> um so and once the usgs has you know, they collect data it's a public agency so it's kind of integral to, to operations that data are made available so you know once once the network moved to digital, then the data sharing happened very organically. But I don't, I don't think it was a, a philosophical, uh, you know, an unwillingness to, to share data, even in the early days. The democratizing effect of having data that's shareable, what did that do to the Seismo Lab's stature in the field? In other words, at some point, because data can be shared freely, did it cease to be or did it become less so a magnet, a place to be, to do research, to attend talks, to interact with the cutting edge research? It might have gone that way, but I think it's still the Caltech Seismo Lab has been the preeminent seismology group for going back to the beginning. And um, there is there is a lot of research done on the data in, in other places. Um, 
So maybe it's allowed, maybe that has allowed like um, a school like UCSD, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, they're doing cutting edge research with data from the seismic network, but I didn't, nobody's ever knocked Caltech off the, the pedestal. Um, so I think you know, part of it is being where the data are, are collected. Um, part of it was an evolution of uh, departments from the, I was in grad school in the 80s and there were a number of, of groups at that time and doing seismology, a number of those got smaller um, over the, the decades or, that followed. Um, and Caltech sort of held its own. And the, so they, one of the things that's happened in seismology is you had the, the plate tectonics revolution in pretty much 1960 or so. So there was a point in 1970, seismology was a hot science, that there was the, you had the National Earthquake Hazard Reduction Program. Um, you, um, you had the USGS getting involved with seismic monitoring. So this you know, big increase in, in data. Um, and then plate tectonics, there were all these you know, new exciting ideas. So there was that sort of fuel, this kind of golden era. And then over time, earth science wasn't the hot thing anymore. Um, so you see there are other sciences, the biological sciences came more to the fore. And um, even within earth sciences, other disciplines besides seismology have gotten to be um, more important. I'd have to think of examples. So I think there was sort of this heyday for seismology, and then there was tied to the heyday for prediction um, in the 70s. And then that waned a bit. And so other departments, a, a department that maybe only had one or two seismologists um, you know, they, they, if anything, their seismology got smaller and, and Caltech um, continued to have the center of, of mass and kept going. So I'm not sure if you've heard this idea that in the 60s and into the early 1970s, all of the revolutions in plate tectonics sort of passed by the Seismolab, that the Seismolab was not central to these developments. I wonder if you've heard the same thing and what the basis is to this. It may be my first book. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> so in my my first book, Earth Shaking Science, I go through the plate tectonics revolution and you know it built steam slowly and then all of a sudden there came a point where that was just the you know the hot new ideas and there was a lot of excitement and paul richards who um is a um, preeminent theoretical seismologist now uh, retired he reviewed the book and he was a postdoc at caltech uh, when all of this was playing out and he said People there just weren't that excited about it. You know, it wasn't, um, they had other other things they were focusing on. Um, I don't, the idea didn't come from my book. I think there's a, a, a recognition looking back that you know, there just wasn't a lot of the, when you look at the, all the seminal contributions and in, in that revolution, Caltech wasn't, uh, the Seismolab wasn't a big player. And was there historical or intellectual baggage since Seismolab has this deep history that might help explain why it wasn't a major player? I'm not sure. I and mean, they, they did for a while have a focus on global seismology. Um, 
So understanding deeper structure, that's what the earth is a planet. And, um, but I really, I don't know, it'd be interesting to talk to somebody and there are a few people around and Paul Richards is one of them who was around at the time. Um, but why they thought there wasn't more interest it may come down to just a small number of individuals and what they're what they're interested in or, or not interested in. So during um, my time in Pasadena, for example, I started working on induced earthquakes and I ended up doing a project with Victor Sai, who was a, on the faculty at the time. And he's just a, he's an all around fabulous scientist who's interested in everything. And he, um, he was aware of my work and was had ideas. And so we started talking to talking and that turned it into a collaboration. So then the seismic lab was was involved with induced earthquake research. But then Victor left for Brown and um, you know, is, is anyone there now interested in induced earthquakes? I'm not sure. So so I'm curious, particularly in light of your graduate work at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography, if you have a sense if there was ever a conscious decision made at Seismo Lab where it would not be a center of ocean-based geophysics research. Hmm. And was that in that. light of the fact that Scripps was there, that it would fulfill that role? Uh -huh. Yeah, I don't know. Um, the oceanographic institutions do tend to be on oceans. So um, I don't, so you have Scripps, you have Woods Hole. Um, I don't know why they never moved in that direction. The timing in the 1970s, as you called it, this was the heyday for earthquake prediction. What was going on at that point that gave optimism that this was something so, that was feasible? It was so it was before the night, it was like more in the 70s. Yeah. And when I started writing my prediction book, I was, I sort of had a cynical view that various um, people and, and institutions would, were pushing to launch the HERP National Production Program. And uh, Frank Press was a, a big player in that. Um, and it was in a kind of strategic interest. They were pointing to earthquake prediction as a carrot and looking, pointing at apparently successful work that was being done in China and, and the Soviet Union. And you know, we need this federal program because the, and this was the Cold War, <laughs> all sorts of swirling issues, but you know, we needed the federal program because the Chinese and the Ruskies were ahead of us and we needed to catch up. And I was sort of cynical um, that it was really, um, it, it was really a matter of, of politics. Um, but then I talked to a number of people, scientists who were maybe 10 years older than I am, who were actually around through um, the 70s, and they talk about genuine interest or genuine excitement of that prediction was um, was within reach and meaningful short-term prediction. So there were a couple of developments right around 1970. Um, one was the theory of what's called dilatancy, and, and so it's it's a theory that came out of um, laboratory work that if, a, if rocks are being stressed, their physical properties will change. So if you think about it conceptually, you're, you have a fault building up to a big earthquake, the physical properties may change in a way you can detect and, and know that an earthquake is coming. So that was the Palmdale bulge. That was the basis for the Palmdale bulge. Um, and then there were induced earthquakes, which were first recognized in the 1960s. That um, 
fluids were pumped into the crust, you could in make earthquakes happen. And so people started to have the sense that, okay, we're understanding how earthquakes work. We understand plate tectonics. We understand kind of what's, what's triggering earthquakes. We understand how the rocks may react to, to build up of stress. So, um, you know, I talked to some, some very smart scientists who, who said that they really, there really was genuine optimism. Um, I'm curious, as we get into the 1980s, what is the overall sense of the Seismolab's contribution to accepting that earthquakes are fundamentally not predictable? Um, well, I think they were, I think they were ahead of, well, I mean, Frank Press was, was jumping on, you know, the, the prediction and, um, but Hiro Kanamori has been a driving force at the Seismo Lab going back to the seventies, I want to say. He's been there a long time and you know, one of the preeminent seismologists of the second half of the 20th century. And he is, I don't know if you've had a chance to talk with him. Yeah. Um, he's an amazing guy. He comes <laughs> into the office every day. Yeah. Um, but he is just, you know, he is a scientist and um, we haven't touched on a whole other chapter of the Seismo Lab involving their um, track record with diversity. <laughs> oh, we'll get to that. That's on the list. Okay. Uh, we may run out of time. But there have been issues at the Seismo Lab. They were legendary. Um, kind of old school, old boy. It's been a problem. And that's what, when I was an undergrad, I was at Berkeley, I asked Bruce Bolt for, you know, for his um, thoughts on grad school. And in retrospect, he and, and a couple other people never mentioned Caltech. And I think it's because they knew that it wasn't a good place for a, a female scientist to be. But Hiro, he, all, he cares about the science. You know, what are the, the data that, and I'm convinced that you could be green and he would, if you came in with ideas about science, I don't think he'd notice that you were green. Um, so, you know, just a really um, amazing scientist who is not, does not care about politics or uh, it's like, and so he was, he wasn't vocal, but he was a skeptic of prediction even during the heyday. And Richter was more vocal. He was a skeptic um, speaking out because he didn't, he thought the prediction claims were, were being oversold. So I think there were these you know, just top scientists at the Seismo Lab that were ahead of the game and, and questioning um, the claims. So it is an important topic. I do want to get to it. To clarify, if you were given advice not to go to Caltech or it was it was uh, specifically <laughs> omitted and you're reading yeah. into why, that's an important point because there's obviously the historical reality that 30, 40, 50 years ago, very few places or no places would have been good for women. But you're saying even within that context, Caltech, the Seismo Lab, was specifically not good relative to other peer institutions. Yeah, it, they have never had a, a good reputation. Lamont is the other one. Lamont already um, now at the observatory. At Columbia. With Columbia. Yeah, they are, the, the two of them, I would say, <laughs> kind of in a league of their own. When I was at Lamont, they had their 40th anniversary, and they have they have faculty scientists were on the faculty at Columbia, and then they have soft money scientists. And when I was there at their 40th anniversary, they had never had a female faculty member at Lamont ever. Um, 
So, and then, um, yeah, the, the Seismolab, um, it was just the, the culture of the place um, seem to, and departments always have their own cultures that are, you know, the tone is set by, by people at the top. And, okay. Outside? Yes, you're bored, I know. <laughs> um, and no, it, it may depend on one or a small number of people. So Scripps, the group I was with, was better than than most, and there were a few people there that were just setting the tone in a good way. There was another group within Scripps that was, had a horrible reputation. So it, it's very, you know, it's very dependent on, on a few, um, on a few people and, you know, what, what tone gets set, what tone gets perpetuated. Um, but yeah, from, from the time, it was really my generation in the eighties when women started to show up in grad school in appreciable numbers. Before then it was just, you know, there were women, but they were, Fewer and farther between. Um, and then when they started to show up, um, it was just a better environment in some groups than in others. So. As I'm sure you know, in higher education across the board, at Caltech specifically, efforts to improve equity and diversity and inclusivity are really at the top of the agenda. Have you kept up with the Seismo Lab and do you have strong opinions on whether it's improved in accordance with the times? You know, I think they are making up for, <laughs> they got a late start. Um, yeah, it's hard to, it's hard to say. It's, you are dealing with small number statistics. So Victor Sai was, was recruited higher um, Asian American and, um, and Asians aren't necessarily underrepresented in science, but they are, um, they can be in our sciences. And then he left, uh, Pablo Ampero was hired. So he was from uh, Hispanic from Peru. He left and it wasn't because it wasn't because they were denied tenure. They made, um, it was um, for various reasons they, they ended up leaving. So um, I think it's gotten better. Um, yeah, for for a long time, the Seismo Lab would um, they like to double count women. So there were the, the few women who were hired had joint appointments, geology seismo lab or engineering seismo lab. And so, um, you know, you, it was essentially, you know, a half of an FTE, which I thought was better than nothing. Um, I think there have been, I, you know, I, I would need to look at a roster of faculty to, to, really know what the balance is at this point. You know? So in the way that we've been talking about the, the Seismo Lab in sort of historical narrative chapters, over the past 20 years, what are some of the highlights in that chapter? What has the Seismo Lab been known for in its modern era? That's a good question. Um, I, I, I get to think about that one more. You know, the whole um, network seismology is a continuing focus and you know, understanding seismic tectonics, um, how, um, I think how to summarize this. Like when you have big earthquakes, how does the 
what do they do to the crust and how do they how do faults interact? Um, and global seismology has been a big continuing focus. So understanding great earthquakes um, and the earthquakes themselves and also and also understanding earth structure. Um, that's kind of focus. Uh, I need to think about that one to come up on. I'm sure I'm missing stuff. Um. So for the last part of our talk, I'd like to touch on your career really in science communication in communicating seismology to the public with a focus on what the Seismo Labs research has contributed to what you've been able to explain to the, to the public. So per perhaps at the most general level, what does the public want to believe as true when it comes to earthquakes? And then we'll get to the hard medicine of what you have to tell them. What does the public want to hear? Um, they usually want to hear that they, they don't have to worry. Like, um, if you just had a big earthquake, you know, oh, you're just going to have aftershocks, but... The aftershocks are going to die down, and um, you can't ever say there won't be an earthquake. Um, so that's kind of a people want reassurance, and, and you, we fundamentally can't reassure them, um, or at least not beyond a certain point. And it's sort of ironic, modern statistical seismology tells us that the odds of a large earthquake are never higher than right after a big earthquake has just occurred. So the time to be most worried is actually right after you just had a big earthquake. And that's because earthquakes always have aftershocks. And that's the one time you can sort of make meaningful predictions about the numbers and rates of expected earthquakes. But the, the numbers are so high that there's a chance you're going to have a quite large aftershock. Um, now there, there are there are some measures of, of reassurance that, um, that you can give about likelihood of, of big earthquakes and likelihood of um, damage and shaking. But people don't like earthquakes and. Um, There's not much that, not much you can tell them that will be fundamentally reassuring. Not if not in California, anyway. That's on a macro time scale, of course. What about Sue on the micro time scale? What do people want to hear when it comes to having as much advance warning as possible? when the big so, one's about to start? And where does the Seismo Lab fit into to, to those advances? Okay, so early warning has is a thing. And the Seismo Lab has had a big part of that um, really since the beginning. So going back, boy, 10, 20 years, coming up with methods to recognize that a big earthquake has happened and then get the warning out in advance of the strong shaking. Um, so some of, so that'd be a, a highlight of work done over the years is, is helping to develop the, the methods that are now used for early warning. Um, so the, we do now have the early warning systems on the West Coast and they're, they're <clears throat> There's still quite a bit of work to be done, um, understanding their limitations and fine tuning the, the messaging. Um, so you know, I think the people would very much <laughs> like a heads up that, that strong shaking is going to happen, obviously, and take away that element of of surprise that makes earthquakes really terrifying that you know, one second you're minding your own business and the next second 
your world comes unglued and that's fundamentally unsettling. So, um, so that is something that seismology can potentially provide. And where are we now? How much realistically do we have in terms of time? How, how long can we, can we prepare people before the shaking it's, starts? Seconds, minutes, it, where, where are we now? Yeah, not minutes, and that's the problem. Um, you know, if a magnitude seven earthquake happens 100 kilometers away or 200 kilometers away, you have time to detect the earthquake, get the warning out, people get tens of seconds. But if you're sitting in Northridge and a Northridge earthquake happens, there's no time. There's always what they call a blind zone. And for any earthquake, you know, if you're sitting on top of it, there isn't going to be time for a warning. There's also the problem um, that if you want to get warnings out fast, you don't want to sit around for 30 seconds and figure out how big the earthquake is exactly. You, you need to err on the side of getting that warning out fast. So an earthquake happens, you know it, it might be big, you get the warning out. Most of the time, the shaking won't be severe. So you to, to make, if you want to warn people for severe shaking, you pretty much have to warn them for weak shaking. But then are you conditioning people to ignore the alerts because the alerts they get are mostly going to be weak shaking? So that's where the, you know, the devil's kind of in the details. Um, oh, <laughs> squeaky toy. Um, and there's a lot you know, figuring out uh, you know, how you want to set the alert levels, um, what the messaging should be. There's just a whole lot of work being done on that still. A topic that that is is permeates all of your writing, the, the notion of unpredictability. My question might touch a little bit on the, the philosophy of science. How do we delineate between our limitations in understanding earthquake predictability versus the earth itself not knowing when it's going to start shaking. And if we want to assert the latter, how can we be sure that it's simply not a limitation of our own theoretical and instrumentation analyses? I guess this is sort of a philosophical debate in science. So there's these terms, epistemic uncertainty and aleatory, and epistemic is the not knowing, aleatory is the earth being, or whatever, being um, complicated and unpredictable. Um, and there's a purist school of thought that if you understood everything well enough, you could predict everything. That the, the earth is not, it has physical laws and you know, in theory, it, we can understand it and we can predict it. Um, I don't ascribe to that school of thought that there's physical laws, but there's also so much complexity that it's just hopeless. We're not, I don't think we're ever going to be able to um, predict a lot of things in detail. Um, because when um, earthquakes happen all the time, the question is what why does one small earthquake keep going and get bigger? And that in theory, if you knew every single thing about a fault and the earth, you could predict it, but it just depends on you know, innumerable little details that you'll never know. So um, I think it's a, you know, <laughs> it's an excellent question. There's, a, there's sort of the philosophical debate of, are things fundamentally unknowable and unpredictable? And then practically, can we make headway? Um, it sounds like both can not, be true. We can make headway without ultimately getting to that goal, it sounds sounds like. Right, or you know, could some aspects of a system fundamentally be predictable even if we can't predict what every little earthquake is gonna do? Um, you know, there's still an awful lot that we don't know. So. so I'd like to ask two last questions, both looking to the future. First, for the Seismolab, given your deep appreciation of its history, 
Where do you see it headed? What are some of the big areas of science that it should focus on looking into the future? And if there is more work to be done on the diversity side, what can it do to encourage more underrepresented people from joining the field generally and the Seismo Lab specifically? Yeah, I think, um, so one new, exciting new direction is being driven by the, the new tech monitoring technologies. So, and the new um, computational technologies. So seismology has become more and more data, data intensive. And you have more data, um, machine learning approaches to analyze it. Um, so uh, Zach Ross is one of the, the best young guys working on machine learning applications. Uh, Zong, I can never pronounce his name. <laughs> Zong Wang um, has been doing some really innovative work with distributed acoustic sensors, DOS. So really, you know, that, that's kind of in the best tradition of the Seismo Lab pushing the science forward by capitalizing on, um, on new approaches to collect and analyze data. And I expect that we're just scratching the surface of, of what's going to come out of that kind of study because it's really, it's revolutionizing seismology in terms of the amount of data that you have and the methods to analyze it. So I expect that that's going to keep going for, for some time. Um, okay. Uh, um, in terms of diversity, I it's tough in, in some respects. Yeah, the one thing I've seen departments lose good people and diverse people because they won't come to grips with the two body problem. So you may have a, a scientist who you'd like to keep female or underrepresented minority or even white male, but they have a spouse who is um, and departments are just they never want universities are really bad in general at making attractive offers to to a pair of scientists even when they're both stellar um it's just you know i think one department doesn't want to feel like they have to hire somebody and, um so if universities as a whole could do better with that i think it would help everybody um oh. yeah, minority there's so few underrepresented minorities in earth sciences that it's a that's still a pipeline problem um, attracting um attracting talented minorities um i think there there is work being done at Caltech and elsewhere to to address some of those issues. Finally, last question for you, Sue, either for the next book project or the next research work, what do you want to do that you haven't done yet? <laughs> Sleep. <laughs> um, I, yeah, um, you know, I've got a, a list of projects at any given time that um, trying to push forward and I haven't run out of ideas yet. I haven't, I don't have a new um, book idea. Uh, the Great Quake Debate, I wrapped up the archival research in 2019. And the book itself was mostly written, it was almost all written by like that summer. And then the pandemic hit. Right. And I just, I, my heart goes out to anybody who was trying to do archival research over the last few years. I would have been dead in the water. I spent hours at the Seismo Lab, at SMU, at the Huntington Library. Um, and that just isn't happening at this point. So in, you know, in part because of that, I just haven't I haven't really been thinking about possible next books. Um, so we'll see. And the Great Quake debate, I wasn't really, that sort of bubbled up. I, I wrote the, 
I have to remember the prediction book and then I sort of took a break. Um, and then I started to work on the 1925 that went to the Huntington Library to look at Bailey Willis's papers and I started to, you know, get interested in who this guy was. So, so we'll see. So we'll see. <laughs> So on that note, I'm so glad I was able to spend this time with you and for you to participate in the Seismolab History Project. I'd like to thank you so much. Thank you.